Forge, Chapter 6. The celebration did not last long. Companies were sent to chase after the retreating British. More men were sent to guard the river in case the enemy tried to float past the encampment and attack us from the rear. The officers ordered the cannons back and bellowed for the carts in the water to be brought to the field. The fellow at the next tree handed me a canteen. Just take a little, he cautioned. The wounded need it more than we do. He walked over to the fellow who sat clutching the bleeding gash on his arm and helped the man drink. I could not move. Find your strength, boy, the fellow yelled at me. They need your help. I followed his example, kneeling besides a lad in a fine brown coat who lay curled up on his side. I helped him sit up and gave him a drink of water. Can you walk? I asked. He shook his head and laid back down on the ground as if I had woken him from his nap. I could not figure if he had an injury to his body or if he lost his wits or both. I moved along to the next thirsty fellow. When the water was gone, I made my way to the woods to where the large group had gathered. An officer directed me to help carry the wounded back to the, ca or back on, uh, back to the camp on a hastily made uh, litters, which were no more than a blanket secured between two poles. I was partnered with a mud-spattered militiaman uh, whose pale face was creased with lines of melancholy. Our burden was a boy with the powder burns uh, in a bayonet wound through the meat of his thigh. He moaned as we lifted him onto the litter, then fell into the blessed swoon. We laid our muskets on either side of his form and grasped the poles of the litter and lifted it. Camp lay two long miles away, mostly uphill. We passed, uh, we passed Patriot dead, including women, or a woman who was killed running ammunition to the field. She still gripped the gunpowder cartridges in her cold hands. A living woman moved around her, some tending to the wounded, others stripping the bodies of our enemies. One of them found a man she must have loved. She sank to her knees and howled, a bone-chilling noise far worse than the wolves. I wish someone would make her stop. My hands and arms quickly tired, then burned from carrying the unconscious soldier. I welcomed the pain, for it blotted the battle from my mind. At last, we reached the hospital tents. Lanterns stood uh, wobbly benches so that surgeons could better see the dugout grape shots and musket balls from the groaning men and the boys. Screams came from the tent that stood furthest from uh, the others. Amputations, said the sad-faced man. Terrible business that we delivered the boy to a surgeon in a bloody apron, guzzled a cup of water, picked up the litter, and went back to the battlefield. The fat pumpkin-colored moon rose, turning bloodstains into shadows. All of the colors of the shirts and the jackets and the uniforms paled to the same shade of gray. We could not find the officer who first ordered us to carry the wounded. My partner would have wandered the field all night, but I stopped a fellow carrying a horse's saddle and inquired, the wounded are all set up at camp, but ye can dig graves if you want. The words came out Irish raft, with, uh, which forced me to listen close. We showed him, didn't we? He continued, killed two of them for every one of us, chased him from the field, and uh, the damn cowards. He walked off, still talking to himself, without waiting for any reply from me. My partner dropped his poles and followed the man. I carried the litter back to camp, for it seemed a sin to waste the blanket. After I set it in the front of the ho or in front of a hospital tent, I dragged my bones up the last hill, following shadowy, silent men. Uh, candles were set up in the un um, set up on upturned logs. Lanterns hung in chains off the tree branches. The campfires burned bright. I slid into a line for grub a fellow with a flower-stained shirt handed me bread and a charred piece of meat and then a round-bellied woman filled my stolen cup with water i ate by the fire and shook my chills when the well, when my food was gone i picked up the bits of meat and grains from my gunpowder that were stuck between my teeth stray bits of talk drifted through my battle muzzy head one of morgan's rangers shot a redcoat brigadier uh, general with a rifle was perched in the tree. We killed more than two score redcoat officers and hundreds of their men, with hundreds more captured and held as prisoners. A thick skulled fellow had a bullet stuck fast in his head uh, and lived. Another took grape shot in the mouth and lost his tongue and most of his teeth. The stories wound on and on. 
My head bobbed forward, startling me awake just before I crashed into the dirt. The fire talk was quiet. Most fellows or most fellows must have crawled off to their tents or brush huts. Some slept on the damp ground like it was a feather bed. I pulled the dead's, dead man's blanket out of my haversack and spread it over my legs and moved the sack so it would pillow my head. I laid my musket next to me and reached for my hat. It was not on my head. I sat up straight and searched, but it was not in my haversack, not tucked into my shirt. I rolled back the day's events in my mind. I'd worn that hat while searching for the road. I'd clutched it to my chest while it's hiding from the skirmish patrols. I was sure I had it when I opened my compass box and when I ran to join this battle. I must have lost it in the confusion after that. You might find it dishonorable, but my eyes watered, thinking that I'd lost my hat. You'd understand if I shed tear, tears for my father's and or for the fathers and husbands and brothers and sons who died that day, and the woman killed carrying gunpowder into battle. You'd say that only a fool would cry over a lost or the loss of a raggedy felt hat, but that had been my father's hat a cast-off from young Master Bellingham. I'd worn it on my head since the day that the Redcoats shot my father on Breed's Hill, and now I'd lost it. I lay down under the pumpkin moon, shamed and heart sore. Uh, the tears wouldn't stop. I covered my face with my blanket, lest anyone takes notice of me.